I just gave you the easiest of the questions and the least complicated problem that I'll lay out this morning. Uh, and one of the things, uh, through uh, Jack and the Superintendents Association, is Ed's going to be available because he'll have the resources of the International Center to help you maybe in your district think through some of these issues. So just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this. Um, I want to take you to, uh, we may have to com uh, communicate the fact that we have a different problem than we're presently solving. Uh, and as we watch the nation's most rapidly improving schools, Number one message, and it's a message I've been saying for 25 years, and I want to underscore that. This is not a message I came up with in recent weeks. Culture trumps strategy. Okay. This has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Okay. Culture trumps strategy. And I think what we keep doing is trying to come up with strategies, not recognizing that the very culture of a large percentage of our population has shifted and is almost anti whoever the establishment is. Mm -hmm. See, I would suggest to you people are not necessarily voting for Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. They're voting against the establishment. And my message to you in education is Congress said, we don't want to be the establishment for education anymore. Let's give it back to those superintendents and let them handle it. You're the new establishment for that group. Emerging trends. Let's put the stake in the ground five years out. The first one I want to hit is technology in the workplace. Um, how many in the room own an iPhone or a device like that? Can I borrow yours for a second? Absolutely. Okay. Yell out. What has this replaced in your lives in the last five years? What do you no longer need because you have this? Throw some things out. Calendar, calendar, calendar camera, phone book, phone, phone, phone book, mm -hmm. calculator, calculator, encyclopedia, encyclopedia, stamps, what's that? Stamps, stamps, and stamps, newspaper. newspaper. Oh, sorry, we didn't. You know, media. We didn't mean your media. Okay. Okay. Maps, memo pad. Maps, memo pad. It's unbelievable, isn't it? I'm not going to do it with you today. But remember, I said I'm going to give you my PowerPoint. You may want to do some of these things. Uh, I often say to an audience, I give you three minutes in roundtables to come up with as many ideas as you can. I've never had a table come up with fewer than 14. Had one table come up with 41 ideas in three minutes. Uh, photo albums, you, you, things that you boarding we, passes, boarding passes, all kinds of things, money, mm -hmm. credit card. <laughs> All kinds of things, depending on how widely you use it. So, does anybody think technology is about to stop? Yeah. For my youngest grandchildren, they're going to see this as something that belongs in a museum pretty quickly. Uh, I predict these will not be around within three years. They consumed us now. More advanced technology will be. But you know where the real technology is impacted? It's not our personal lives, it's the workplace. And the one I want to, uh, and, and think about some businesses. Think about Uber. Uber today is the world's largest taxi company. And it owns no vehicles. You know Uber is worth $64 billion. And it's six years old. And it's an app. Uh, Facebook the world's most popular media uh, owner, owns no content. Uh, Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, owns no merchandise. Airbnb, the largest hotel accommodator in the world, owns no real estate. But while all that happens, you want to have a revolution as a superintendent? Try to change a bus schedule and see what happens to <laughs> Change the school calendar by two days. We'll have four committees over six months to discuss this momentous decision. Do you understand what a fixed mindset we have? 
and we're so deep into it we can't even see it. At the end, I'm going to show you who's going to be your biggest competitor in three to five years. Absolutely the one that's going to terrify public education down to their toenails. It's Google. I'll show you by the end. Because see, they're taking an approach to education like these groups did. But here's the issue. Technology has invaded the American workplace, whether you like it or not. Think about how many people lost a job because of an ATM uh, or a kiosk. Number of jobs gone, just because of those two. And technology invaded the workplace, but as it invaded the workplace, it especially invaded entry-level jobs, there are fewer entry-level jobs. How could that happen? And it's because we'll see that it also has reconstructed the entire end of work environment and has created more jobs at the top. There's more people at the top. And that group at the top up there, um, they eat out once or twice a week. They have help with child care more than others. They have somebody maybe once a week help clean their homes. They have somebody else mow their lawns. That group has created a huge and growing service sector in this nation. But that service sector doesn't pay enough for an individual to be uh, financially independent. New York State. It's made the decision, and it's one I celebrated. Uh, one I actually signed a petition for when they were trying to do it, which is to raise the minimum wage for fast food restaurant workers to $15 an hour. And it passed as of June 1. And McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's have all announced by June 1 in New York State they will go 100% kiosk. Whoa. <laughs> They've figured out that the people shop at and buy food at McDonald's know how to use kiosks. Are comfortable with it. A fraction of the cost. <clears throat> The next thing I'm going to say may be the single most important thing of the entire morning. What technology did to entry level jobs, it is about to do with a vengeance to medium wage jobs. Let me say it again. What technology did to entry level jobs it is about to do with a vengeance to medium wage jobs. It's because the web is about to go to, into web 3.0. Web 1.0 was Google. What do you think of Google? Originally, the original Google, uh, by the way, you know Google wasn't even patented until 1998. Didn't take legs until 2002, 2003. But with Google, you use keywords and headers. It was called a Web 1.0. Web 2.0 uh, was called anticipatory, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, best example I can give you Web 2.0 was Facebook because it was called interactive. Unlike Google, which was one way, you created it or nothing happened with Google, Web 1.0. Web 2.0 uh, became interactive. Facebook is the best example. Web 3.0 is coming over us like a tidal wave, and it's called the anticipatory 3.0 web. It's got artificial intelligence. It's got very, very deep data mining. Overly simplistic. If Jack had given me a whole day today, I would have spent the next hour explaining the anticipatory 3.0 web. <coughs> because maybe you really need to understand it if you don't understand it. And it's this. If you can write an algorithm for a task, the job is gone. So the Department of Labor 
just came out with a report, revised its earlier report, and accelerated the decline in certain jobs they were predicting two years ago. Now they shortened the timeline for these jobs to disappear. They're predicting in the next five to eight years, there will be a 94% job loss in accountants and auditors. Why? In case you can write an algorithm. <clears throat> Task does it quicker, more efficiently than a human being. But forgive me, I know I'm on a college campus. There's not a university in this country cutting back on accounting and, accounting and auditing majors. Why? Still viable, 2016, gone by 2022. 43% job loss in economists. Financial invest, investment jobs, 91% job loss. If you can write an algorithm, the job is gone. Now here's the question. If you're in the middle and you lose your job and you don't have the skill level to go up, where are you headed? Down. America was always built on a strong middle class. American public education was designed to prepare people for the middle class. Who is it <coughs> that Trump and Sanders have tapped into? I agree. That group. <coughs> that group. We're saying, I lost my job. Or I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. Where am I going to go? But educators, it's not new. Started in 83 with an ancient risk. No child left behind, common core. Every state in America, including North Carolina, put four words under the standards. Anybody remember what they were? College and career. And you know what we heard? College prep for CTE. That's what we heard, because that's what we got in place. Auto tech. I'm only going to give you one example in depth. I'm in the process of writing a white paper for the Model Schools Conference. Jack, we will provide you that paper as soon as it is done. And I'm going to ask you to send it to all your superintendents in the state. I'm only going to drill deep on one occupation today. The paper is going to have five. And Ed, make sure we remember to give it to everybody. I want to take you to Auto Tech. Uh, I was down in Troop County, Georgia. Uh, it's about 75 miles south of Atlanta. Did a presentation in the county and uh, did educators during the day and the superintendent uh, Cole Pugh had asked me if I would uh, meet with some business leaders, do a presentation for the chamber at night. I did. Afterwards, this guy comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, Bill, do you know there's going to be an 80% uh, reduction in auto mechanics in the next five years? I got no idea who this guy is at the time. I said, mm, that seems a little far out to me. He said, no, no, it really is going to happen. Well, long and short of it, what I found is, well, Kia, uh, U.S. headquarters, are in Troop County, their largest manufacturing plant. This has got senior vice president in charge of North American operations for Kia I'm talking about and talking to. And he explains it to me um, and then invited me to a meeting in Detroit where the R&D people from six major manu uh, auto manufacturers, and these are the big ones, GM, Ford, you name it, had gotten together, uh, and they get together periodically <coughs> to share each with each other key innovation, and I was astounded that they was, were sharing with each other, but they don't share the inside uh, <laughs> secrets. They share the big ones that they think will need to have federal or state legislation to help them really be able to materialize, and one of them is the driverless car, okay? But he invited me just as an observer to listen to their discussion. 
And so at the end, they said, hey, Bill, you've been observing. You got any questions? I said, yeah. Somebody told me there's going to be an 80% reduction in auto mechanics in the next five years. What do you think? Went around the table. A couple of them disagreed, said there won't be because there are too many old cars out there. They're still going to need auto mechanics. But that's absolutely true, all of them, they said. With the new cars, except a couple of them then said, no, no, for the new cars, the reduction is far more than 80%. And let me explain why. Anybody in the room own a 2015-2016? Does it have a lot of technology on the dashboard? Today, depending on the car, you have anywhere from 250 to 400 microprocessors in a car. One of those microprocessors has more computing, com power, more computing power than the largest mainframe computer on the earth had in 1983, the year we began to talk about school reform. <coughs> and they communicate with each other. Point number one. Point number two. Anybody in the room ever hear of nanotech? I live in Albany, New York, nanotech center of the country now. Ever hear of robotization? Nanotech has invaded robotization. And so they're embedding more and more uh, microprocessors on the car. Over the next five years, they'll go from 250 to 400 to somewhere between 500 to 800, depending on the car. Analyzing everything. And then miniaturized robotization. The robot will actually go in and fix a problem before the problem actually occurs. Miniaturized robot monitors everything. Uh, the microprocessors monitor <coughs> everything. And I want to give you the example. I'm going to show you the video. They showed me the video that day. I understand that this, uh, they showed me a prototype of the video. I understand it's actually been on television, although I haven't personally seen it. Has anybody seen the new ad for the Ford Fusion going over potholes? Okay. So what it is, is this. <coughs> they have put, and all the cars are doing it. All the dealers, are, uh, manufacturers are doing it. They're putting uh, microprocessors in the bumpers of the car that track even the myopic hole in the road to a large hole in the road. Could be, and it, it identifies instantly while you're driving at full speed, any pothole in front of you, and it identifies its uh, length, its depth, and its breadth. Communicates it to the shocks. Microprocessors in the shocks communicate it to the roboticized uh, nanotech devices. The shocks then lift the car over the hole at exactly the height of the road before the pothole in the end you never even feel it. I'm going to show the ad. To demonstrate it, what they've done is put eggs and ping pong balls in the holes and watch the cars drive over it. I'll come back and show you what this has to do with education in a moment. Now here's the real problem. You know who hates this? The dealerships. Mm -hmm. Why do the dealerships hate this? They make their money on service, not on the sale of the car. So they're going to have to shift, and that's part of the discussion going on in the industry. They've got to shift to when you buy the car, you're going to buy a service contract. Okay? 
which will activate all the technology. Okay? And then what happens to keep the technology running, you don't have an auto mechanic. You have an information tech specialist who, by the way, doesn't have to be in your community. That worker could be where? Anywhere in the world. Got it? Let me keep going. I'm just warming up. These are some of the other industries that will give you in the next several weeks a white paper on. What is the healthcare? How many of you have had a physical in the last year? Did you find that your doctor spent more time looking at the computer and peppering you with questions than they did what they used to do, which is touch us, feel us, look into our eyes? How come? Because the medical field is moving the same way the auto field is, auto mechanics, which is they're moving from intervention for a car when the car is damaged, for you when you're sick, to prevention. And what they're doing is that there is a series of indicators that the data tells us are the key indicators to keep you healthy. And that's what you're peppering you on. By the way, anybody in the room have a Fitbit? Mm -hmm. You know the new Fitbits now will communicate directly with your doctor if you choose to have them. And your doctor's given you a website to go to get your own data about your own health. It's all about the prevention. <clears throat> Let's go back to auto mechanics. What's the second largest career and tech ed program in the United States? Auto tech. What program requires the greatest square footage and the greatest investment in terms of the technology? They're all uh, outdated within the next four to five years. <coughs> By the way, you think the auto tech teachers and CTE people are going to charge and say, yeah, get rid of the programs? <laughs> <laughs> healthcare. Healthcare is moving away from so much simply the, med the personal touch on medical to medical records. It's being driven by medical records. Uh, financial investment, totally changing in terms of, and just think about the issue of. Uh, the anticipatory 3.0 web, artificial intelligence, deep data mining, <coughs> displaces tons of workers. That's why these middle, middle wages jobs are disappearing. And supermarket drugstores, when you go to the supermarket and drugstore, are you getting on the back of your receipt coupons? Do each of you get different coupons? How come? Because it's not just what you bought, that includes. It's deeper than that. When you signed up for the card, you know what you just did. You let them inside your data system. They not only know what you're buying, they know who you're emailing and what they're buying. And they can develop a profile for you instantly. Uh, information systems. Manufacturing is moving in the same direction. You haven't been in a modern manufacturing plant. Anybody thinks the old industrial plants are coming back? Are tr clearly truly 20. 20th century. Uh, McKinsey report out in January said in the next three years, 5% of all U.S. jobs will be eliminated because of technology, because of Web 3.0. May not sound like a lot unless you're one of those 5%. The bigger issue is 30% of the task and 60% of the remaining jobs will be eliminated. You know what that means in terms of lifelong learning? And so the question becomes, what do you need? And before you get all bent out of shape, and I understand why, on technology, and if you share with your faculty, your community, some of the stuff I just shared with you, it will make them very anxious. So let's pull back and say, however, isn't technology really improving our lives? And isn't the case that we need to adjust to a technological world? So let me show you two videos. 
of how technology has fundamentally and irreversibly changed some children's lives. I want to show you a piece of technology where a little girl got not glasses like you and I have. This little girl was nearly blind at birth. She gets a new pair of glasses and she sees her parents for the first time ever. Is, is not one of a member of my family, but some of you know this story. I have, uh, Bonnie and I have five children, but our youngest child, uh, when he was 11, was run over by a drunken driver and was in a coma and on life support for nine months. In the process, Paul s suffered multiple skull fractures that severed his inner ears and crushed his vocal cords, which means no hearing. Uh, 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 he speaks in a way that you could not understand it. How many have heard of the cochlear implant? Okay, it has made incredible advancements in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going to show you a little uh, baby who gets a cochlear implant, but just a, a version of it, and hears his parents for the first time. Uh, Bonnie and I, Bonnie's my wife, and, and Sam knows my family. Uh, we experienced, we didn't, we didn't, we saw Paul, my son, hear his three sons for the first time ever, after getting a device like this. And so, uh, here's a little baby, watch what happens. Recording, Clockman. First hearing. First hearing aid. With Sam. It's why people are talking about college and career ready. We didn't hear it. We didn't hear it at all what they were trying to say to us. We tried to force the old system to respond. When it comes to higher ed, we're not doing so well. And fully, Congress said I'm in a university. But these are your graduation rates in your state. You're graduating 35.1% of your kids in your four year colleges. This is every state in the country. In your two-year colleges, you're graduating 12.3%. Donald Trump tweeted this very information Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to the people in North Carolina. I don't like Donald Trump, but I'm on this tweet. <laughs> I want to see what he's saying. Because you know what we tell parents? We tell them on graduation night how many kids are going to college. We never tell them how many complete. Now suppose you're facing the potential of losing your job, or you just lost your job. You got huge college debt <laughs> for your kids. 
And you look at this guy. <coughs> and they just handed the ball to you. Congress said, we can't solve it. And so, again, a discussion for much deeper. And Ed, I'm hoping that some of these districts in the room, you actually can spend some time to sit down and talk to them in depth and, and look with key faculty and key academic people in your district to really get under the hood to see what's the difference in the academic skills for the workplace versus the academic skills for higher education. And if you get that information, you can't have it as one news release. You can't have it as something you say at back to school night. You're going to have to figure out how to get that message repeatedly from different direction, the way the millennials are communicating. Uh, because the other problem you face, and we all face, and it's why Congress walked away from education so. They said, we got a bigger problem that's going to face us. And what is it? We're all getting older. And America is an aging nation. And they looked at what happened to nations like Japan and so on that had the same problem just a few years before us. Um, we presently have 40 million Americans over the age of 65. 40 million. How many in this room have an elderly parent you're having to help now take care of in some way? Is this not a true statement? There are not adequate services. Right now. It's really tough. I got a 97 year old dad. Sam, how old your mother in law? 101. 101. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's not adequate services. We have 40 million of them. 2030, year 2030. 85 million Americans over 65. And Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, bankrupt by that. <coughs> you know where the taxpayers are going to have only one place to take out the anger in terms of taxation? Your school budgets. Congress said, we give up. Let's get out of this business while we can get out of it. <laughs> Let's turn it back. 50% of white households that filed for Social Security last year, head of household, 50% of those households had total liquid assets of $10,000 a year or less. And that's liquid assets. Doesn't count fixed, doesn't count home. These are the liquid assets. They are one financial hiccup away from disaster. 75% of black families, 80% of Hispanics. It's the information Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are tweeting every day. Saying, tell me, what do you think you need to solve this? These are the 11 most gifted and talented young people in the United States. Can anyone guess whose grandchildren they happen to be? <laughs> and they are a mixed group, as you can see. Some of them are adopted. That young lady, that young man, that young man, and that young man are in your state. Four of my 11 grandchildren live in your state. Uh, I want this state to have the best education system in the world. But you know what I've concluded? I spent so much time as a parent and now a grandparent thinking they were my responsibility. You know what I've concluded? They are my responsibility. But even more importantly, they're our hope. <clears throat> if we don't make that group, highly productive in the 21st century, you're not going to have the retirement you're even remotely hoping you're going to have. Because when I said we have 40 million headed to 85 million over 65, some of us will work 
trying to prepare or help our parents, <coughs> you understand you're next. Yeah. And, and, and then who are you going to be the bigger advocate for? The disabled or the schools? So final piece, and then we'll take a break. And we'll come back from break. I'm going to give you the most important discussion question of the morning that you're going to really spend some time on. So what do you teach? What's the difference? What's the difference between college ready and career ready from an academic point of view? And it goes that the key math is statistics. Every business group has identified it and it's nearly non-existent in the Common Core. It's data analytics. Deep, deep data analytics. It is reading. But I'm going to stop because I'm going to push it bright. It's not the reading we're teaching. It's not the reading we're teaching. Now, the reading we're teaching, don't think, is unimportant. It's, it's very important. But in North Carolina, you predominantly use English language arts as your platform to teach reading. And English language arts is predominantly fiction. In a workplace that will require what? Nonfiction. And how many of you, honestly, in this room, have at least one clock in your house or in your car that is off by one hour at least six months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Got the manuals, can't you read? Mm -hmm. And how you teach the reading that relates to the 21st century workplace through a literature-based curriculum? And the answer is, you don't. We'll come back to that after the break.